from Seattle, Washington, it's theCUBE, covering KubeCon and CloudNativeCon North America 2018. Brought to you by Red Hat, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, and its ecosystem partners. Okay, welcome back everyone. This is theCUBE's live coverage here in Seattle for KubeCon and CloudNativeCon 2018. I'm John Furrier with Stu Miniman, breaking down all the action, talking to all the top people, influencers, executives, startups, vendors, the, the foundation itself. But we're here with two co-leads of Kubernetes at Google, uh, legends in the Kubernetes industry, uh, Tim Hawken and Brian Grant, both with Google, both co-leads at Google, GKE. Thanks for joining us. Legends in the industry. Oh, Kubernetes is still a short life, but still, yeah. being there from the beginning, you guys were instrumental at Google of uh, building out and contributing to this massive uh, tsunami of 8,000 people here. Who would have thought? I yeah, mean, it's pretty th crazy. It's amazing, it's, it's grown. It's a little overwhelming. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's almost like you guys are celebrity status here uh, in, inside this, this crowd. How does that feel? It's a little weird. I sort of uh, I, I don't buy into the celebrity culture for uh, technologists. <laughs> I, I don't think it works well. Yeah, <laughs> we agree. But it's great to have you on. Let's get down. Let's get down to it. Kubernetes certainly the rise of Kubernetes has grown. It's now pretty mainstream. People look at that as a, a key linchpin for the center of cloud native, and we see the growth of cloud. You guys are living it with Google. What is the importance of Kubernetes? Why is it so important? Um, fundamentally, at its core, has a lot of impact. What is the fundamental reason why it's so successful? I think, I think fundamentally Kubernetes provides uh, a framework for driving migration towards cloud native patterns across your entire operational infrastructure. Um, the, the basic design of Kubernetes is pretty simple and can be applied to automating pretty much anything. And we're seeing that here. There are at least uh, half a, more than half a dozen talks about how people are using uh, the Kubernetes to control plane to manage their applications or workflows or functions or things other than just core Kubernetes uh, containers, for example. Uh, and it, cloud native is about, uh, you know, one, one of the things I'm involved with is I'm on the technical oversight committee of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Uh, so I uh, drove the update of the cloud native definition. Um, if you're trying to operate with high velocity, deploying many times a day. If you're trying to operate at scale, especially with containers and functions, scale is in increasing and compounding as people break in their uh, applications into more and more microservices. Um, Kubernetes really provides a framework for managing that scale and for integrating other infrastructure that needs to accommodate that scale and uh, that pace of change. I think Kubernetes speaks to the pain points that users are really having today. Uh, you know, everybody's a software company now, right? Uh, and they have to deploy their software, they have to build their software, they have to run their software. And these things, they, they build up pain. And when it was just a little thing, you didn't have to worry about scale and you know, internet scale and web scale, it was, you could tolerate it within your organization. But more and more, you need to deploy faster. You need to automate things. You can't afford to have giant staffs of people who are running your, your applications. Um, these things are all part of Kubernetes purvey. And I think it just spoke to people in a way that said, I suffer from that every day, and you just made it go away. And what's the core impact now? Because then now, people are seeing it. What is the impact to the organizations that are rethinking their their entire operation from all parts of the stack, from how they buy infrastructure, which is obviously cloud, you see some cloud there, and then not deploying applications. What's the real impact? Uh, I think the, the most obvious, the most important part here is the way it changes the way, the way it changes how people operate um, and how they think about how they manage systems. It no longer becomes scary to update your application. It's just a thing you do, and if you can do it with high confidence, you're going to do it more often, which means you get features and bugs fixed and you get your rollouts done quicker, and it's amazing the result that it can have on the user experience, right? User reports a bug in the morning and you fix it in the afternoon, and you don't worry about that. Yeah, you, you bring up some really interesting points. I, you know, I think back 10 years ago, from a research standpoint, we were looking at, you know, how can the enterprise do some of the things that the hyperscale vendors were doing? 
uh, I, I, I feel over the last 10 years, every time like Google released one of those great scientific papers, we'd all get a peer inside and say like, oh hey, you know, when I went to the first DockerCon and heard how Google was using containers, when Kubernetes first came out, it's like, oh wow, maybe like the rest of us will get to do something that like Google's been doing for the last 10 years. You know, Brian, maybe bring us back a little bit to you know, Borg and how that led to Kubernetes and you know, are, are we still all, the, the rest of us just doing whatever Google did 10 years ago? Yeah, Tim and I both worked on Borg previously. Uh, Tim on the node agent side and I worked on the control plane side. Uh, Borg, one th lesson we really took from Borg is that really you can run all types of applications. Uh, you know, people started with stateless applications and we started with that because it's simpler in Kubernetes. But really it's just a general management control plane for managing applications. And with the model of one application per container, then you can manage the applications in a much more first class way and, in, and unlock a lot of opportunities for op, uh, automation in the management control plane. So at, at Google, um, several years ago when we started, uh, Google had already gone through the transition of moving most of its applications to Borg. Uh, and it was after that phase that Google started its cloud effort and the rest of the world was doing VMs. When uh, Docker emerged, we were in the early phases, Tim mentioned this in our keynote yesterday, of open sourcing our container runtime. Uh, when Docker emerged, we, it was clear it had a much better user experience for the way folks we're managing applications outside of Google, and we just pivoted to that immediately. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, when uh, when Docker first came out, you know, we took a look at it. We, my my uh, Node agent team in Borg, and we went, yeah, you know, it's kind of like a poor man's version of Borglet, um, and we sort of ignored it for a while because we were already working on our open source effort, and we were open sourcing it not really to change the world and, and make everybody use it, but more so that we could have conversations with people like the Linux kernel community when we said, we need this feature, and they'd say, well, why? Why do you need this? We could actually demonstrate for them why we needed it. And uh, when Docker landed, we saw the community building and building and building. I mean, that was a, that was a snowball of its own, right? Uh, and as it caught on, we realized we know what this is going to. We know once you embrace the Docker mindset that you very quickly need something to manage all of your Docker nodes once you get beyond two or three of them. And we know how to build that, right? We got a ton of experience here. Like, yeah. We went to our leadership and said, you know, please, this is going to happen with us or without us, and I think it, the world would be better if we helped. I think that's an interesting point. You guys had to open source to do collaboration with Linux to get that, that flywheel going for you guys out of necessity. And then when Docker validated the community acceptance of, hey, we can just use containers, a lot of magic will happen, it hit the second trigger point. What happened after that? You guys just had a debate internally? Is this another MapReduce? What's happening? Like, we should get behind this. And I knew there was a, uh, a big argument, or debate, I should say, within Google. At that time, there was a lot of conversations. How do we handle yeah. this? And that was around the time that Google Compute Engine, our infrastructure as a service platform, was going GA and really starting to get usage. Uh, so then we had um, an opportunity to enable our customers to benefit from the kinds of techniques we had been using internally. So I don't think the debate was whether we should participate, it was more how. For yeah. example, should we have a fully managed product? Uh, should we have do open source? Should we do managed open source? So those were the really the three alternatives that we were yeah. discussing. Well, congratulations, you guys done great work and certainly Thanks. huge impact to the industry. And I think it's clear that the motivation to have you know some sort of you know, standardization, de facto standard, whatever word can be used to kind of let people be enabled on top or below Kubernetes is great. I guess the next question is, how do you guys envision this going forward and as a core? How, you know, if we're going to go to decomposition with high, low levels of granularity, tying together through the network and cloud scale, and the new operating model to have confidence in this, how do we preserve, how does the industry maintain the greatness of what Kubernetes is delivering and bring new things to market faster? What's your vision on this? I, I talked a little bit about this this week. Um, you know, we've, we've put a ton of work into extension points, extensibility of the system, um, trying to stay very true to the original vision of Kubernetes, right? It is a box, and Kubernetes fits inside the box, and anything that's outside the box has to stay outside the box. Um, 
And this gives us uh, the opportunity to build new ecosystems. You can see it in networking space and you can see it in storage space uh, where whole uh, sort of cottage industries are now springing up around doing networking for Kubernetes and doing storage for Kubernetes. And that's fantastic. And you see projects like Istio, which I'm a big fan of, it's outside of Kubernetes. It works really well with Kubernetes. It's designed on top of Kubernetes infrastructure but it's not Kubernetes, and it's totally removable and you don't need it, and there's systems like Knative which are taking uh, the, the serverless idea and up-leveling Kubernetes into serverless space, and it's happening all over the place, and we're trying to sort of pretty fanatically say no, we're staying this big and no bigger. It, it, yeah. It's a really, you know, from an engineering standpoint, it's much simpler if I just build a product and build everything into it. You know, all of those connection points, you know, I, I go back to my engineering training, it's like every connection point is going to be another place where it could fail. Now I've got all these APIs, there's all the security issues and things like that. So, you know, but what I love what I've heard here is some of the learnings that we've had in open source is these are all of these individual components that most of them can stand on their own. They don't even have to be with Kubernetes, but all together you can build lots of different offerings. So how do you balance that? How, how do you look at that from kind of a design and architecture so, standpoint? So one thing I've been looking at is how do we ensure compatibility yeah. of workloads across Kubernetes in all different environments and different configurations? How do we uh, ensure that the tools and other systems built in the ecosystem work with Kubernetes everywhere? Uh, so this is why we created the conformance program to certify that uh, the critical APIs that everybody depends on behave the same way. And as we try to improve the test coverage of the conformance suite, we're focusing on these areas of the system that are highly pluggable and extensible, right? So for example, the, the kubelet in the node has a pluggable container runtime, pluggable networks, pluggable storage systems now with CSI. Um, so we're really focusing on ensuring we have good coverage of the pod API, for example. And other parts of the system, people have swapped out an ecosystem, whether it's Kube Proxy for Kubernetes services or the scheduler. Um, so we'll be working through those areas to make sure that they have uh, really good coverage so users can deploy, say, a Helm chart or you know, their case on a configuration or whatever, uh, however they manage their applications uh, and have that beha behave the same way on Kubernetes everywhere. I think you guys have done a great job of identifying this enabling concept. I mean, what is good enabling technology? Allowing others to do innovation around it. I think that's a, a nice positioning. What are the new problem areas that you guys see that are to work on next? And obviously, things are developing in the ecosystem. You mentioned Istio, service meshes, people see value in that. Security certainly is a big conversation we've been having this week. What, what new problem areas or uh, problem sets you guys see emerging that are needed to just tackle and just knock down right away? I, the most obvious, the thing that comes up sort of in every conversation with users now is multi-cluster, multi-cloud, hybrid, uh, whether that's two clouds or on-prem plus cloud or even across different data centers on your premises, um, it's a hard topic. And for a long time, Kubernetes was able to sort of uh, put our finger in our ears and pretend it didn't exist while we built out the Kubernetes model. Um, and now we're here at a place where we've crossed the, the, the adoption chasm, right? We're into the, yeah. the real adoption now. Uh, and it's a real problem. It actually yeah. exists and we have to deal with it. And so we're now looking at How's it supposed to work? Look, philosophically, what do we think is supposed to happen here? Technologically, how do we make it yeah. happen? Um, how do these pieces fit together? What primitives can we bring into Kubernetes to make these higher level systems possible? And you, would you consider 2019 to be the year of multi-cloud in terms of the evolution of trying to tackle some of these things from latency to... Um, yeah, I'm always <laughs> reluctant to say the year of something, because... Uh, uh, or the media BDI. Business. Someone has to get killed, and someone dies, and someone's winning. It's the it's year, the of, year of desktop. Something. Um, <laughs> exactly. But, uh, BDI, just, yeah. I think multi-cluster is definitely the hot topic right yeah. now. Yeah. Uh, it's certainly almost every customer that we talk to uh, through Google and tons of community chatter about how to make this work. I mean, you're seeing companies like NetApp and Cisco, for instance, and how they've been getting a tailwind from the Kubernetes. It's been interesting, right? I mean. They need, you need networks, okay? They have a lot of networks, so they can play a role in it. So it's interesting how it's designed to allow people put their hands in there without kind of mucking up the main. Yeah, I think that really contributes to the success of Kubernetes. The more people that can help add value to Kubernetes, the more people have a stake in the success of Kubernetes, uh, both users and vendors and developers and contributors. We're all stakeholders yeah. in this endeavor now, um, and we all share common goals, I think. Well guys, final question for you. I know we got a break on time. Thanks for coming on, I really appreciate the time. Talk about an area of Kubernetes that 
most people should know about that might not know about. In other words, it's, there's a lot of hype around Kubernetes. And it's, it's warranted, there's a lot of buzz. What is an important area that, that's not talked about much that people should know more about and pay attention to within the Kubernetes uh, realm and of, of that world? Is there an area that you think is not talked about enough that should be uh, focused on in conversations, press, or just in general? Wow, that's a challenging question. Um, you know, I spend a lot of my time in the infrastructure side of Kubernetes, the lower end of the stack, so my brain immediately goes to uh, networking and storage and, and all the lower level pieces there. Um, I think there's a lot of policy knobs that Kubernetes has that not everybody's aware of, um, whether those are security policies uh, or network policies, uh, and, or you know, there's just a whole family of these things, and I think we're going to continue to accrete more and more policy as more people come up with real use cases for doing stuff, um, and it's it's hard to keep that all in your mind, but it's really valuable stuff down there. For programmability, it's like a holy yeah. grail, really. Yeah. Thoughts on uh, things that uh, <laughs> put you on the spot there? <laughs> yeah, no, uh, I think this question of how people should change what they were doing before, if they're going to migrate to Kubernetes, you know, to operate any app workload, you need at least uh, monitoring, and you need really CI CD if you want to operate with any amount of velocity. Right, so when you bring those practices to Kubernetes, should you just lift and shift those into Kubernetes, or do you really need to change your mindset? And I think Kubernetes really provides some, some capabilities that uh, create opportunities for changing the way uh, some things happen. I'm a big fan of GitOps, uh, for example, and managing uh, declarity, de uh, managing the resources declaratively, using uh, version control as a source of truth, and keeping that in sync with the state in your, the live clusters. Uh, I think that enables a lot of interesting capabilities like instant disaster recovery, for, for example, migration to new locations. Um, so I, and I, there are a few folks here who are talking about that and giving that message, but we're really at the early stages there. All right, well great. Great to have you guys on. Thanks for the insight. Got to, got to wrap up. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, Tim. Appreciate it. Live coverage here. Cube is at KubeCon, CloudNativeCon 2018. I'm John Furrier, Stu Miniman. We'll be back after this short break. <laughs>